Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be pretty much looking at maxillofacial and we will be covering ameloblastoma. This is a new addition to my review channel series. We will be covering surgery subspecialty topics. So we'll be covering topics in maxillofacial. We'll be covering topics in anesthesiology. We'll be covering topics in, of course, uh, ear, nose, and throat, and we'll also be covering topics in ophthalmology. So today we're pretty much going to be looking at ameloblastoma. So if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, and let's go. So like I start all my videos on the channel these days, we pretty much want to start off with our warm-up question. So concerning ameloblastomas, A, are the least common clinical, clinically significant benign odontogenic tumors? Of course, this is true or false. Then B, are slow-growing tumors? C, frequently present resorption of roots of teeth adjacent to the tumor is seen? D, treatment ranges from conservative curettage to watchful neglect. So I want you to keep this question in mind. You may just note down your answers right here and then you can change them as I teach you about ameloblastoma, but I will give you the answers at the end of the lecture. So when you actually look at the word ameloblastoma and you actually break it down, so you have amyl, which just pretty much means enamel, the hard part of your tooth. Blastos just means germ cells. So in, in, in a strict sense, ameloblastomas are pretty much tumors of germ cells that form enamel or gem cells that are going to be forming enamel. Contrary to what is actually suggesting, ameloblasts are not going to be arising from, or ameloblastoma rather, is not going to be arising from ameloblast. Now you can actually refer to this as, uh, by many names, previously it was referred to as adamantinoma, but we can refer to it as Eve's disease, we can call it as multilocular cystic disease of the jaw, and we may also refer to it as ameloblastoma. So this is going to be a slow-growing, locally invasive, benign odontogenic tumor, and it's going to be found in the maxilla, it's also going to be found in the mandible. Now, it's actually the most clinically significant odontogenic tumor, and even though we generally know that this tumor is benign, there is a potential of it actually being malignant. So it can undergo malignant transformation and become a malignant ameloblastoma or an ameloblastic carcinoma. And both of these entities are actually distinct things. Then there are predominantly four types or rather four presentations. The most common being the conventional. You can also refer to it as a solid. You may refer to it as a multicystic. You may refer to it as a multilocular. This is going to be accounting for roughly about 74 to 86. So you can just say 70 to 85 percent or 75 to 85 percent of the patients. Then you have the next common being the unicystic or unilocular. I will show you a picture about how we differentiate between these two. This is accounting for about 13 to 21 percent. Then of course you may have a peripheral type or an extra osseous type, which is pretty much arising outside the bone material then you may also have a desmoplastic type so those are the four predominant types conventional or multilocular unicystic or unilocular peripheral or extra osseous and desmoplastic now what's the pathogenesis of this uh, tumor so it's pretty much theoretically going to be arising from remnants that are going to be responsible for making up the odontogenic epithelium. So it can arise from things like the rest of the dental lamina. It may arise from things like developing enamel organs. It may arise even from epithelial lining of other odontogenic cysts because when we'll discuss about dentigerous cysts, dentigerous cyst walls can actually transform and actually come up and become an odontogenic um, ameloblastoma. Then of course they may also arise from the basal cells of the oral mucosa, like from the gingival mucosa, and this actually gives rise to the peripheral uh, variant, the extra osseous variant in short. But ameloblastoma is also noted to arise from a different types of cells that are uh, known as the rest of malassase, so they also do arise from this structure. And it is well known that ameloblastomas may actually occur due to certain changes in the lining of non-neoplastic cysts like I already told you with dentigerous cysts and of course they may also arise from the cells, uh, the cell rests in the capsule. Then what exactly are the clinical features? Remember we talked about four types with the most common type being the conventional ameloblastoma or the multicystic ameloblastoma. 
So that's what I'm going to discuss first. So you have the conventional meloblastoma type. So even though this actually has is a benign lesion, it's actually going to be having a behavior of a low-grade malignant tumor. So what exactly do we expect with this tumor? It's going to be slow growing. It's going to be locally invasive. It's going to have high rates of recurrence. So the, the high rates of recurrence give us, gives us vibes of this tumor actually being malignant because benign tumors generally they won't give you that high chance of recurring. They may recur, yes, but not as high. And of course, they are going to be occurring across a wide range of ages, so between third to about seventh decade of life, and most patients are usually found between 20 to 50 years. And it is actually rare in very young individuals. By young, I mean those that are younger than the age of 10. And then it's uncommon in between the ages of 10 to 19, uh, but though about 10% of the cases are reported to arise in children. Then, of course, there is no gender predilection, so I wouldn't say that it's much more common in males than it is in females or females than it is in males, so it's an equal distribution. 80 to 85% of these tumors are going to be arising from the mandible, with the most common region actually being the, the molar angle ramus region. So as we can see, this region here, we can see that there are demarcations here. Here you have the mandible which of course is going to be divided into different parts. Here you have the angle of the mandible, okay? Then the ramus, and then of course the molar region is in this region. So this whole region here, that's where most of the tumors are going to be arising. As we can see here, 66% is coming from here. Then the next common side is of course the side almost towards the, the um, where the, it joins the other mandible, the, the word has gone, the symphysis. Um, menti, okay, or the mental, the synthesis mental. I don't know if I've said that right, but the word has gone from my head. Then this is accounting for about 10%, then of course we have 11%. So the bulk majority are going to be found in the mandible, then the other others are going to be found in the maxilla. So about 20% are going to be found in the maxilla, the posterior regions of the maxilla. Now most amyloblastomas are going to be asymptomatic in the early stages, but they can actually gradually cause some symptoms. They may cause facial asymmetry because it's a growth that is slowly growing. And then of course they will have some loosening of teeth, they may be changing occlusion, so the teeth will not be meeting completely when you put them together. They may be poor den um, denture fit, fit, you may also have a uh, very rarely you may have some pain, you may have some paresthesia. Whenever you get pain and paresthesia, you should think two things, especially with growths and in relation to maxillofacial. It means that it's either whatever is growing has been infected, so there's an infection that's going on, an infectious process. That's one reason why you could get pain in this individual. Or the second thing is that it has spread and started now to involve the nerves. So once it's now involving the nerves, there's pain or it's compressing on a nerve causing the pain and causing the paresthesia. So those are the things that you should keep in mind whenever you see pain, whenever you see paresthesia. So here's an example of what an amyloblastoma actually looks like. As we can see, it actually grows to quite some proportion. We can see these two variants here from the intraoral aspect and from the extraoral aspect over there. So this, of course, is amyloblastoma. And then the amyloblastoma actually is going to present to you as a swelling in the jaw, most commonly at the angle of the mandible. So it's going to be gradually progressive. It's typically asymptomatic, but the larger sizes can actually extend to the vertical ramus. They can also become painless, or rather they may become painful, but they are painless. They are smooth and hard. So they actually cause expansion of the outer table of the mandible. Now, the clinical signs that you may actually elicit, you may get things like facial asymmetry, malocclusion of the mouth or the teeth. You may have um, unerupted third molar teeth. And then when you palpate the mass, it kind of feels like as if you are walking on eggs, like eggs, eggshells rather. You're walking on eggshells and they keep crackling or they keep cracking. So you refer to that as eggshell crackling. So this tumor can actually enlarge and extend to, uh, to the extent of actually thinning the bone out and then you get this eggshell crackling. And of course, you may, it may actually be an incidental finding when you actually do a radiograph. Then of course, in the unicystic or unilocular type, you're going to be having 50% of the cases actually happening in the second decade. 90% of them are going to be occurring in the posterior mandible. And you're going to have this well-circumscribed radiolucency. It may sometimes be surrounding an unerupted tooth. So actually, this may actually resemble a dentigerous cyst. 
when you look at the radiograph here when you see a unilocular ameloblastoma it may be actually confused with a dentigerous cyst then of course you may sometimes get scalloping of the margins then of course with the peripheral type or the extra osseous type this is actually quite rare it may avo uh, involve the gums it may involve the alveolar mucosa and then of course the mandible is more affected than the maxilla histopathology is actually pretty identical to the intraosseous type then of course your differential diagnosis your peripheral odontogenic fibroma so what do we expect to see when we do a radiograph or we take a picture of this so 80 percent of them like i said are going to be in the mandible 15 to 20 percent of them are going to be in the maxilla the region where you expect to see this is you may expect to see this in the third molar region it's more often localized and it's more often unilateral it may actually appear to be originating from uh, occlusal of develop developing teeth then if you look at the edges the edges usually tend to be well defined and you get a, a, a corticated border so maxillary lesions on the other hand are going to be ill-defined if they're in the, in the mandible they're going to be well defined if they're in the maxilla they're usually ill-defined but they're well localized then of course the shape is going to be round or oval of course it may be scalloped around the roots of a tooth then of course appearance is of two types okay so it may have some septations in them or some divisions within the same radiolucency you refer to that as a multilocular appearance they may be of two types if they are small or large divisions you refer to that as a soap bubble appearance i'll show you that picture in the next slide if of course they are small you refer to that as a honeycomb appearance then of course you may have a unilocular appearance which may be associated with an uninterrupted tooth you may get other things on the x-ray like bone resorption root resorption you may get tooth displacement sinus displacement cortical plate expansion and even thinning you may get destruction of the mandibular canal then of course the number most commonly you get a single lesion then the size there is an unlimited size potential so it can actually grow to very very large proportions so here is what a multilocular looks like where you get these small loculations you refer to that as a honeycomb appearance when you get these larger um, loculations you refer to that as a soap bubble appearance of course there will be a radiolucency that you have in the x-ray then of course here you have a unilocular type which may be associated with an unerupted tooth you will get things like root resorption bone resorption tooth displacement sinus displacement and even cortical plate expansion now what's our differential diagnosis if you get a unilocular lesion like i told you you should suspect that this could be a dentigerous cyst so it may be associated with an unerupted third molar tooth it may be an odontogenic keratocystic tumor which is associated with also with an unerupted third molar tooth uh, and it um, may also be uh, associated with an adenomatoid odontogenic tumor which is usually seen in the anterior region and occurs somewhere in the second decade and then it may also be a dental abscess now, of course, if it's a multilocular lesion, you may associate that with an odontogenic keratocystic tumor. Of course, it's less expansive and possesses these curved septae and there is no buccal ex expansion with odontogenic keratocystic tumors. Then it may be uh, a giant cell um, granuloma. You may have an osteoclastoma of the mandible. You may have an odontogenic myxoma. You may have an ossifying fibroma as well as a central hemangioma all those are differential diagnoses to consider whenever you get a patient that has amyloblastoma and then when you do your histopathology of course there are different patterns that you're going to be seeing so you may see follicular plexiform acanthomatous acanthomatous i don't know what's happening to my english uh, granular cells you may also get dysplastic cells you may also get basal cell types then of course the follicular and the plexiform uh, types are the most common for your exam as an undergraduate they wouldn't really test you on this and uh, but don't get my word for it but if they did then i think that would be very very unfair of them now of course the investigations that we'll do of course the imaging that i told you about is known as an orthopantomogram and it may show you these multilocular lesions with a honeycomb appearance or even a soap bubble appearance and then of course you may also see an uh, uniloculated lesion of course with an associated unerupted tooth you may also want to perform a biopsy that you will send for histopathology and uh, perform a ct scan to ex actually examine the extent of this lesion then of course treatment is dependent on the severity of the tumor so the biopsy is pretty much your um, 
should remove uh, should be removed for your definitive diagnosis if it's a small unicystic lesion you may perform a nucleation or even marsupialization which is where all um you may take a much more conservative approach with these two things but of course we, by doing this there is a much higher chance of recurrency with the multicystic lesions which are aggressive you want to perform a radical resection of the tumor so you want to perform radical resection of the head and the neck of the mandible you can actually do an end block or even a segmental resection of the mandible you remove a part of the mandible and of course the resection should cut into the normal tissue one centimeter of the normal radiological tissue and remove this remove the segment that is involved then of course you may perform hemimandibulectomy where you remove half of the mandible and re reconstruction of that half you reconstruct something and use implants then of course there shouldn't be any radiotherapy remember that this tumor has the propensity of actually becoming malignant so you should not offer radiotherapy to these patients now back to our warm-up question and these are the answers so ameloblastoma are the least common clinically significant benign odontogenic tumors that's false they are actually one of the most significant then they are slow growing tumors that is true they frequently present resorption of roots of adjacent teeth to the tumor scene that is true and treatment ranges from conservative curatage to watchful waiting that's false we usually either perform a nucleation on marsupialization but there is a high chance of recurrency so we just want to resect these tumors i really hope you learned a lot from this lecture and for more lectures like this to come subscribe to the channel hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time i post i shall see you in the next video tell a friend to tell a friend that we are doing more topics on the channel to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time bye bye